Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. I would like to add my acknowledgement um, of the traditional owners of these lands and to recommit Cancer Australia to improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people affected by cancer. And it's always, it always feels, as someone who um, came to this country uninvited, uh, having grown up in the UK, it's always wonderful to feel that one is welcomed onto uh, the lands of the people, so I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also delighted to be here, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me, um, Christine, and uh, the team at, at Rare Cancers Australia. So, um, yes, slides, here we go. Um, the Australian Cancer Plan, um, driving equitable cancer outcomes for all Australians. And I must say, Richard, in response to your remark, um, I am actually incredibly grateful that you and Rare Cancers Australia and the National Oncology Alliance advocated for an Australian cancer plan because it's given me probably one of the most satisfying um, parts of my career to actually be responsible for um, pulling it together. I, I didn't do it on my own. This is something that was done with the entire Australian community and I think that's what gives it its power, actually. Um, so, here is a little picture of the Australian Cancer Plan. Um, the idea of it, the 10-year ambition, is that we will have world-class cancer outcomes and experiences for all Australians affected by cancer. And that is not where we are now, as we have been hearing. So, um, we went out across the whole of Australia and we asked everyone what they wanted. And what people told us was, if they had to get a cancer, they wanted it found as early as possible. They wanted the world's best cancer treatment, which has to be underpinned by the world's best research and clinical trials. And they wanted to be cared for. And I think those three things together are really important um, and resonate with everybody. It's a website, not a book. And that means a lot more people can see it than would be able to see it otherwise. And you can go into it from many different perspectives so that you can look at it from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lens and see what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people told us they wanted. And you can look at it from different lenses that have different needs in cancer. So it's, it's actually quite a fun, I know that's a, an odd word to use in cancer, but a fun interactive resource. And it has these, um, it has two year and five year goals associated with the six strategic objectives, and the strategic objectives are there. Um, but we have actions that will get us to five years. So we have two-year actions and five-year actions. We don't have the actions between five and 10 because we know the field is changing and we will not be starting from the same point in year five as we are from last November when it was launched by the minister. So we have to be flexible about what's gonna happen next. It addresses all cancers. It doesn't name every individual cancer separately because actually that would take away from the all cancer line, but it focuses on disparity of outcome and experience. So if you have a rare cancer that has a poorer outcome, you are right there in the center of this. It was developed using Cancer Australia's um, usual uh, comprehensive stakeholder engagement strategy, but that means everyone owns it, which is really lovely. Um, it puts the optimal care pathways as national standards to help consumers navigate the system smoothly. We need to describe what it should look like so that you know whether your treatment is coming up to that standard and whether you're being provided with all of the services that you deserve. It focuses on those 10 priority groups at risk of poorer cancer outcomes and experiences, and we will keep evaluating it as we go. Its implementation is a partnership between Cancer Australia, the government, and the whole sector. So everyone is invited to partner in the plan, and you might hear a bit more about that later. So here are some initiatives that are specifically aimed at supporting people with rare and less common cancers. Um, the co-designed and accessible navigation models. The I Everyone in this room can tell me a horror story about going, having a referral, going to a hospital, and then getting sort of dropped by the system because somebody didn't know what to do or somebody was off sick or something went wrong. It should be possible. 
that once you have a diagnosis or you're being investigated for a diagnosis, that there's a pathway ahead of you that you can follow where you travel only when you have to travel, you have all the care and investigations as close to home as safely possible, and there's a seamless flow in and out of the centre. I know it's a stretch goal, but we have to have these stretch goals or we'll never improve the system. Um, it's, it has to be culturally safe, trauma-aware and healing-informed care. We've got a long way to go in a system that we know is systemically racist. It has the optimal care pathways as routine care. It's digitally enabled wherever possible, using all the modern technologies to free up the brain space of the people looking after patients to make sure they can do their job properly. So everyone working at the top of their scope of practice. I know I sound a bit like Pollyanna, but if you don't have the, the high ambition, you never change anything. We have to have better clinical trial design and um, David Thomas up the back there is, is busily working away on that. Georgina's working away on that. It's all about making sure that we do trials that actually answer the questions we need answered to make the outcomes and experiences better for the patients rather than just doing another trial testing drug A against drug B. So it's, it's a very ambitious plan. The genomics framework is part of it. The workforce, getting the workforce sort of ready and able to do this is really important. And of course, if you don't have good data underpinning it and share that data and use it properly, you never actually can tell what you're up to. So, so at the end of the 10 years, um, these are our ambitions, personalized evidence-based early detection, optimal cancer care with excellence in outcomes, culturally safe, equitable, and responsive care, technology and research and data to improve the outcomes, an engaged, capable, and future-focused workforce that's culturally safe and responsive, achieving equity for First Nations people affected by cancer and for everyone affected by cancer. Now, supportive care is a long-term interest of mine, and I was actually so pleased when the community told us that they wanted to be cared for, because treating the cancer is all very well, but if you kill the patient on the way, that is actually a fail, and if the patient has a miserable quality of life, it's also a fail. So, so we really do need to do supportive care possible, pr properly, and supportive care makes excellent cancer care possible. This is the tagline of MASK, which is my you know, favorite society in the world. Um, so supportive care is the prevention and management of the adverse effects of cancer and its treatment. Physical and psychological symptoms and side effects across the whole cancer journey from diagnosis through treatment to post-treatment care. It aims to improve the quality of rehabilitation, secondary cancer prevention, survivorship, and end-of-life care. So it's basically everything except the bit where you treat the cancer. And why is it important, apart from the fact that it's what people want? It empowers patients. It improves quality of life. It addresses unmet needs. It improves outcomes. If you actually look after patients properly on the journey, they do better, they live longer, and they're happier. It reduces pressure on the healthcare resources because if you look after people properly, they require less catch-up care, as it were, and it ensures cultural safety. So since the plan was launched last year, Cancer Australia has been busy on some foundational issues that will enable the rest of the system to work well. And these actually pretty much all align with the rare cancer moonshot, which is lucky because it would be very unfortunate if the moonshot and the cancer plan did not align, but they do. Um, so the things that we're doing are setting up the National Framework for Genomics in Cancer Control, uh, setting up a framework for the optimal care pathways to make sure they can be properly embedded in the system, developing a national cancer data framework, which you know, is, is a job that we've been trying to do, I think, for my entire career, but we're going to, we're going to do it. Um, the support for the Cancer Clinical Trials Program that actually has been ongoing for a while, and then the development of the Australian Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is a, a mechanism through which all of these other things can occur. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these um, as we go through. So the National Framework for Genomics in Cancer Control, the strategic objective one in the plan is maximizing cancer prevention and early detection. And we've put genomics in here, not because it only fits in here, but because it 
fits in here, and this is the front end of the cancer journey. So action 1.5.1 of the 46 actions that we have is to develop a policy framework for genomics in cancer control across the cancer care continuum in five years, but the two-year action was to undergo ongoing assessment of the evidence for risk-based, cost-effective population cancer screening. Now, actually, the cancer genomics framework will be finished by the end of this financial year because, we, you know, when you're on a roll, you just have to keep going. It's really, it's a very important framework because it is, it's the tool of the future in, in cancer. And this is uh, just a picture of what the draft looks like. At the centre, we have personalised, equitable cancer care. And it actually has four quadrants because genomics is important in prevention and early detection, in diagnosis and treatment, in supportive care, and in education and awareness. So we have to do all of those things. We need to also consider on the outer ring the workforce and models of care. It's not ever going to be viable to have a genetic counsellor that can see every patient with cancer. We, we're never going to be able to train that workforce. We have to mainstream some of the work that is done in, in genomics. There are funding considerations which we, are, we and many others are working very hard on. There are quality and safety issues. There are ethical issues which actually sit more with the Genomics Australia area, which is looking at genomics for the whole of healthcare. We're concentrating on cancer, and it's really important to get the research and data right. But of course, as in all things with cancer, if it works for cancer, it can be expanded to other things too. So this will all be useful. Um, the National Cancer Data Framework, again, as I said, this is one of those big issues that we have to fix and we have to get right. The two-year goal here is develop an agreed national cancer data framework to improve accessibility, consistency, and comprehensiveness of integrated data sets and uh, to develop a minimum data set as well. There's a lot of work going on nationally in data reform, and we are working with all of the people involved in order to get this right. Um, my deputy, Claire Howlett, and um, our head of our data branch, um, Cindy Toms, have just done a 10-day, eight-jurisdiction meet with the department data people tour. They're in Brisbane today as their final stop, and they'll be back here tomorrow because it's important for us to actually go and talk to these people face-to-face -to, -face to have the conversations about the fact that Yes, you all collect your data slightly differently, and yes, you all collect slightly different data, but the bottom line is it doesn't have to be perfect to be shared and to be useful for cancer outcomes, and so that's what we're trying to do. Now, we're partnering with Cancer Council Australia, who had done a huge amount of work on this prior to the pandemic, and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, and we know that there are all these problems, disparate sources, data gaps, completeness, timeliness, access, but we're going to try and fix them. And the framework will set a strategic direction and priorities for the collection, management, use, and ongoing development of comprehensive and consistent health and cancer data. And if we can crack this one, that in and of itself is going to improve outcomes for cancer patients. And so what we are saying, because data never seems sexy enough when, you talk, when you're trying to sell it as a really important issue. But we now say up front, data saves lives. So this will, we need everybody, you know, when you're doing your best advocacy, just remind everyone that data saves lives and that we need this work done. The support for cancer clinical trials, the two-year goal is uh, action 4.2.2, ensure targeted and innovative research investment into areas of unmet and emerging need and improve clinical trial design and equitable access. So that's the one that says, don't just keep doing the same trials you've been doing forever, let's do something new. Increase the number of clinical trials in Australia, increase participation by people affected by cancer because we're still not getting more than, I don't know, five to 10% across the country if you look at everybody, much better in you know, places like MIA and places like the, the big comprehensive cancer centers, but not uniform. And what about the people outside of the city? We need uh, priority populations, rural and remote um, patients in the trials. We need more sites. We need to be, you know, post-COVID or during COVID, we suddenly were able to enroll people in clinical trials 
not in the big centres. And we were able to do electronic consenting and we were able to do all sorts of amazing things outside of the city. We need to keep doing them. We need to not let it slip back to it's got to be in the ivory tower because that's not good enough. And we need to increase involvement of everyone, policymakers, clinicians, researchers and consumers in trial development. Um, but 50% of the 14 clinical trials groups that Cancer Australia supports have a specific focus on developing trial protocols for rare and less common cancers. I don't think that would have been the case 10 years ago. Um, we need to keep that going and increase all of those things. So um, another very important part of the trial. Now, the National Optimal Care Pathways Framework, the, the optimal care pathways are sort of the benchmark, as I said, for care. And I, I, I know there are lots of confusing issues about optimal care pathways and guidelines and treatment. So the way I look at it is the optimal care pathway is the global holistic sphere of the cancer journey for a particular tumor or a particular population. We're now up to around about 30. I've lost count how many we have because it keeps increasing. And we are in the process of discussions about a generic rare cancer one. We already have some rare cancer ones, but we're looking at a more generic one that will be more inclusive. So that's your optimal care pathway. And then cutting through that only in a couple of bits of the journey, so not the whole journey, we have um, clinical practice guidelines that might take, tell you the sort of treatment you need depending on your stage of disease and where it is and that sort of thing. So they're also very important, but they're two-dimensional as opposed to the globe. And then when you've got the, the individual patient and you've decided what the treatment for that patient is using either chemotherapy or radiotherapy or any other systemic therapy, then you have the EVIQ guidelines that tell you that protocol and how to give it and what the supportive care meds are for that particular one. So it sort of goes from three to two to one dimensional, but they're all really important and we have to keep all of them active and um, maintained. And we've deliberately put the optimal care pathways at the centre of the Australian Cancer Plan because it sort of makes the holistic care of the individual patient right there in the middle. And this is the vision um, that we'll have integration of these pathways into clinical practice as a standard of care. Um, they'll be e equitable, equitable, I can't speak. Um, and the, the framework is aimed at everybody, again, so that everybody can see what we're supposed to be doing. And then we can hold the system to account when we do that. So I won't read you all of those things, but they tell you how, how that's going to work. The bit that holds it all together in the Australian Cancer Plan, however, is the Australian Comprehensive Cancer Network. Now, this was, I think, a two- or a five-year goal that we achieved in six months because this was a really, really important one. At the, round, the ministerial roundtable where the Australian Cancer Plan was kicked off, the leaders of the comprehensive cancer centres in Australia said to us, we want a network of ourselves so that we can work together and improve outcomes. And we said, yes, that's a very nice idea, but you're the ivory towers. We want everyone. So we said, we'll, do it. we'll create a network for you that includes absolutely everywhere that cancer is treated across the country and every person who wants to be involved because we have a vision for a fully integrated and inclusive network of comprehensive cancer care across the nation in which every patient, wherever they may be, is linked to the best evidence-driven prevention, research, diagnostics, treatment, and support for whichever cancer they have as close to home as safely possible so that their cancer is found early, they receive the best possible cancer treatment, and they feel cared for. So this is the way that we implement all of those other things. And this was launched um, by the minister in July, I think. Um, it's a self-governing network, and it has, and the the sort of the committee driving it originally um, has set the standards of excellence, which are to deliver comprehensive cancer care, which can be networked. It doesn't all have to be. You know, you don't have to have everything in the one place. Deliver equitable access to culturally safe care across the cancer continuum. Deliver research excellence. Collect, share, and report comprehensive cancer data to drive service improvements and better outcomes. Foster an engaged, capable, and future-focused workforce. Deliver connectivity and sharing of expertise across the network. And self-evaluate performance and adhere to the standards of excellence. So as you can see, all those other pieces of work are actually then monitored by the network. And this is the, 
the framework, it's like a spider's web, I see it, a spider's web in which everyone gets the best care. So, um, oh, that was the last slide. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and there's lots of work to be done, but we do want everyone involved. And if anyone wants any information or to hear about anything to do with the cancer plan, just sing out. <laughs>